Think of the human brain like a library, and each book as a single memory. Now, these memories not only make us who we are, but they allow us to make sense of the world. And then later, we recall these beautiful experiences with exquisite detail. As a result, when we cannot remember, it's heartbreaking. Of course, there are natural cases of forgetting, like where we parked our car or where we put our keys. This happens to me all the time. <laughs> But then we have to deal with memory disorders, among which Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common. It's been over 100 years since the discovery of Alzheimer's. As of 2017, every 66 seconds, someone in the United States develops Alzheimer's. So what does this mean for our generation? One out of nine people over the age of 65 will develop Alzheimer's. This could be your friend, your sibling, your parents and grandparents, or you. Although there are no promising treatments available today, we do know that Alzheimer's broadly has two phases. An early phase in which patients experience memory loss, but their brain cells and architecture appear normal, and a later stage in which the brain architecture itself begins to degrade. Neuroscientists and physicians have spent the past several decades trying to identify the primary cause of this disorder, focusing really on detecting these changes in brain architecture. While this has helped identify hallmarks of an Alzheimer's brain, it does not help us treat memory loss in early stages. And this is important because the early stages could last for many years, if not a decade. And perhaps by treating symptoms early on, we may be able to either slow or reduce disease progression. There has been some hope that electrical stimulation of the brain in early stages may improve quality of life. But this is like being in a car crash and jump-starting the battery, hoping to fix the entire car. This approach hasn't been very effective because of how complex the human brain is, and so our treatments need to be more targeted. Many failed attempts highlight an important problem. We don't really understand memory loss in early Alzheimer's. Is it because the information has been erased from the brain? Or that it's still there and just cannot be accessed or retrieved? In the context of a library, have we lost these books? Or we just can't find them? With this in mind, I became a neuroscientist, interested in early Alzheimer's. I had extra motivation to pursue this problem. In high school, I remember being especially fond of my grandma. We would play Scrabble, watch movies, and she would cook my favorite food. Now, fast forward 10 years, when I returned to India to visit her, I walked into her room and in silence realized that she couldn't recognize me. She had no idea who I was. After my experience with grandma, who had Alzheimer's, I started looking into standard medical procedures used today to determine if someone has Alzheimer's-like memory loss. I had a striking realization. We ask a patient to describe significant events in their lives, and when they cannot at the level of detail as a normal human subject, they're diagnosed with some form of memory loss. But wait, when you or I have to remember something, there are usually two steps occurring in our brain. We first need to locate this memory information, and then as we begin to retrieve it, I can start to verbally describe it. What if memory loss in early Alzheimer's is not because the information has been erased, but it just cannot be retrieved effectively? I decided to investigate if this may be the case using animal models. Now, you must be wondering, how do we know these animals, or in my case, mice, have Alzheimer's? Good question. We can look at the brains of these Alzheimer human patients under a microscope and compare them to our animal model samples. 
What you'll notice are these large round deposits known as amyloid plaques, a hallmark of Alzheimer's, which appear similar in both human and mouse samples. I then needed a way to determine if these mice had memory loss symptoms similar to those reported for human patients. To be honest, if I could just ask them if they remember, it would have made my life or research a ton easier. <laughs> I even tried. I did not have much luck. I decided to use a behavior test in which these mice have to form a new memory, which would say something like, this place is scary. It's actually quite simple. We take a mouse, you place it in a new environment, and you deliver mild foot shocks, which they won't be happy about, similar to the feeling we get when touching light switches with wet, with wet hands. And a day later, we bring these mice back into the same box. Normally, mice are very curious and active in a new environment. But when they remember this place is scary, they don't move around so much. When we performed this behavior test with early Alzheimer mice, we noticed that they treated the scary box as if nothing bad had happened. In other words, they couldn't remember what happened the previous day. So we spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out what was wrong in the brains of these Alzheimer mice, which is kind of like looking into a black box. One morning, we caught a break. As we were studying many different brain samples, we noticed something. The neurons in the brains of these Alzheimer mice that stored this fear memory experience had fewer connections with one another. Take, for example, this green memory neuron among the many other blue neurons. Now, if we zoom into one of these branches, what you'll notice are these tiny protrusions, each of which represents one point of communication with another neuron in the brain. The fact that early Alzheimer mice had fewer connections taught us something. Think of each of these protrusions as the individual lanes of a toll booth, where a source neuron is trying to send information, the cars, to a destination neuron. Now, when all lanes are open, information transfer is a smooth process. But what happens in Alzheimer's is that some of these lanes are closed, and as a result, the mouse cannot remember. This was a turning point for our research because we knew what was wrong in the brains of these Alzheimer's mice, and we needed a way to fix it. I chose a method that allows us to activate memory neurons with pulses of light in order to mimic the speed at which neurons in our brains communicate. By repeatedly doing so, I could get them to strengthen their weakened connections, which is like reopening all lanes of the toll booth. So here's the million-dollar question. Does this bring back those supposedly lost memories? Let's return to the fear behavior test and see what happened. So we first let these early Alzheimer mice experience this fearful event. And a day later, we brought them back and placed them in this scary box to measure memory recall. As you can see, the early Alzheimer mice were curious and active in a scary place, the exact opposite of a normal mouse. At this point, we applied our neuron connection restoring protocol and retested them. To our surprise, the early Alzheimer mice were now scared of the box, exactly like normal mice. In essence, we made these forgetful Alzheimer mice retrieve its lost memory. So when I started researching memory loss in early Alzheimer's, just like everyone before me, I assumed that when a patient cannot tell us about a past experience, it has to mean that this information is probably erased. I was wrong and now realize that at least in the earliest stages, the memory information may be in the brain, but just cannot be accessed or retrieved. Those books, those memories, they're not lost. They are still in the brain. And since our common goal is to treat memory loss in early Alzheimer's, boosting memory retrieval may be the most effective way of achieving this goal. If we can either reduce or slow disease progression, the impact on society and their families would be well worth the effort. In the case of grandma and me, she might have remembered Scrabble Nights or my favorite food, which would have meant the world to me.
So now this brings us to an equally challenging question. How do we translate these exciting animal model studies to human therapies? First, future research needs to focus on the earliest stages of Alzheimer's rather than later stages. And second, our research institutions need to be funded and encouraged to find ways of boosting memory recall. Once this happens, not only can we take advantage to treat memory loss in early Alzheimer's, but also apply this to other human disorders which may have similar symptoms. In my own research since the initial discovery, I am working towards less invasive ways of achieving similar results. In some very exciting preliminary experiments, I have noticed that introducing specific genes, DNA, into these weakened neurons can strengthen their connections. Now, with all sorts of exciting new research, there will be challenges that we have to overcome. In the future, ideally, we would be able to strengthen these neuronal connections using pharmacological agents. But with these types of approaches, we have to work extra hard to make sure that side effects are at a minimal. So we found light in the brains of these Alzheimer mice, a black box, and have a way of repairing the broken parts by strengthening neuronal connections and boosting recall. We learned that in the earliest stages of Alzheimer's, memory information has not been erased, but it just cannot be accessed or retrieved effectively. Coming back to the library, those books are still there. We've just lost the ability to find them. We have a long road ahead of us, but there is hope, which is a powerful driving force. Let's work together from researchers to funding institutions and do our best to treat memory loss in early Alzheimer's.